earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves the treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where is your heart when you leave tonight? Is it on the treasures of the world or the rich treasures of heaven? Your heart cannot be in two places. For it'll break. Find the treasures in heaven, novice world, where moths and vermin destroy and thieves steal. With a heart searching for the treasures of heaven, we can begin to have strong faith behind closed doors. When we do, we can have a heart to hear what God is telling us and where he might be guiding us where he can use us for those unbelievers, atheists, or even fellow believers. I can tell you from experience that when you have a heart on the treasures of heaven, life gets so much easier. And I just wanna end on that. And we're gonna pray real quick. So please bow your heads and take off your caps. Dear Heavenly Jesus, I'm just so thankful for everyone here tonight that we can just praise you and glorify you, Lord, I just want to challenge you students to look for the treasures of heaven and not of this world. Just give them the strength to do this in their school, their workplace, just in their household maybe. Lord, you give us the strength and let us have the strength to have great conversations tonight. And in your name, amen. All right, all right, everybody, let's all come to the front. Y'all know what time it is. Staring into your eyes makes my heart come alive Suddenly brought to life when I met you Sweeping me on the skies, running deep, stretching wide Perfect love realized, here with you Love is for real, you will never let go, never let go Oh, when it's more than just words, love beyond our control, out of control Alright, y'all, let's go! This is real love, this is real love, come on! brought to life here with you. One, two, three, jump!
I don't understand I can't comprehend All I know is I need you I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding No reason to wait my heart My heart needs a surgeon My soul needs a friend So I run to the Father come before you tonight we just want to run to you run to you in whatever whatever place we're at in our lives God I pray for Nathan as he's gonna come up Lord would you speak through him and would we be able to receive what your spirit wants to tell us let us not only be hearers of the word but let us be doers we love you so much Jesus we pray that you would show up tonight it's through your spirit we pray amen Okay, go find a seat. Thank you, worship team. That was awesome. Thanks, Dane. All right, make your way back to your seats. Don't knock my iPad out of my hands. Thank you. There we go. Hi, Miriam. Hey, guys. Well, hey, guys, I'm Nathan. For those of you that don't know me, um, I'm one of the youth pastors here, and we are, okay, yeah, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, and we are so glad and excited that you are here tonight. We're actually kicking off a new series. It's called the We're Just Talking series. I'm sure you guys have heard that phrase. There's our graphic for you. Um, and tonight, I get the great privilege of speaking about singleness. Yeah, raise your hand if you're happy about singleness. I'm happy. I'm excited about this. And don't tune out whether you're dating, single, married, engaged, whatever it is. This message has something for you. So please don't tune out. But I don't know if you knew this about me, but um, ever since middle school, I loved my hair. Okay. For those of you that might be colorblind or in the back, I have bright curly red hair and I've loved it. But if you can believe it, my hair actually used to be crazier. Yeah, that was, that was me 
all the way up until my freshman year of high school, I had curly, long, red hair. I was known as the Afro guy. And I loved it. That was a part of my identity, was the crazy red-headed hair guy. Yeah, you can take pictures of that. Yeah, please do. Please do. But freshman year came, and I wanted to go out for the boys' basketball team at Barlow. And I made the team, hallelujah. But one of the program rules was your hair had to be shorter than ear length. And obviously, mine was not. And so I was stuck. And I actually was devastated because this hair is a big part of who I was. So I had to decide. I loved basketball so much. I loved playing basketball, but I also loved my hair. And so I was stuck, but eventually I decided because of how much I loved basketball, I was going to cut my hair. And I did. And it was hard at first. It wasn't super easy. But eventually I started getting happier and happier with it. And I realized that was the best thing that could have happened for me because I didn't look like that anymore. And I got to play basketball. And to be honest with you, there's no way Isabel would have gone out with me, who is now my fiance, if I still had that fro. So that's the big win. That's the big win. But what happened in that story was I decided to give up something that I loved because there was something that was more important to me. And to one degree or another, I'm sure all of you have experienced something like this, where you have to give up something because you love and are devoted to something that's more important. We've had times like that, whether it's you want to play video games or go hang out with your friends, but you're failing pre-calc, and if you fail this next test, you have to take it again next year. So yeah, you have to give up the video games and the hangout to do your homework. Or if you're going to go to a movie with your friends, but then your family says, hey, we're going to Disneyland, you're going to give up the movie because you get to go to Disneyland, right? Our passage today talks about this same thing, that when we love two things, but something is more important, that we're able to give that up for the thing that we desire most. Before we get into our passage, uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this evening, for all these students that were able to come. I just pray that as we uh, get to talk about your word, that it would settle on our hearts, that we would hear from you, that we'd be attentive, that we'd be focused, um, that you would use me to teach them something awesome about you. We're so grateful for you and how much you love us and what you've done for us, God. And we just pray this all in your son's name. Amen. Okay, so we are going to be reading 1 Corinthians 7, 25 through 38. And this is a letter that Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. And they're having a little bit of a rough time. And this passage in particular is about singleness. So let me read it. All right. The unmarried and the widow. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in the view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you of that. From now on, let those who have wives live as if they had none, and those who mourn as if they were not mourning. And those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods, and those who deal with the world as if they had no dealings with it. For the present form of the world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord and how he can please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. The unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and in spirit, but the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks that he is not behaving properly towards his betrothed, if his passions are so strong and it has to be, let him do as he wishes, let them marry. It is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desires under control and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. Okay, there's a lot there. But the first question I want to ask you guys is what do we learn about God in this passage? It might not seem obvious what Paul is saying, but we learn that God deserves our undivided attention. That's what Paul is trying to say. This is an important part. That God deserves our undivided devotion. 
To clarify what devotion means, it means love or loyalty and enthusiasm for a person or thing. And that's what Paul is saying that we need to have in our lives towards Christ. But I told you this message was about singleness and what does devotion to God have to do with singleness? Paul is saying in this passage that singleness is actually amazing. Singleness is good. Being single for your life is good because it allows us to be uniquely undivided in our devotion to the Lord. We know this, but anytime there's a new relationship, that relationship's gonna take time, right? I'm sure many of you had had a friend that got a boyfriend or a girlfriend and then all of a sudden you started seeing them less. Happened to me, my best friend in high school, we were both single and we were hanging out constantly, like multiple times a week, the whole weekend we were together. But then all of a sudden he went out and got a girlfriend and I started seeing him less. We'd make plans and he would text me five minutes before I was about to leave and say, oh, I can't, sorry, I'm hanging out with my girlfriend. And there was even one time in particular, I remember he invited me to his house at around like eight o'clock and I got there and he wasn't even home. So I'm hanging out with his family for like three hours before he shows up. He's like, oh, sorry, I lost track of time. I was hanging out with my girlfriend, right? And this story shows that my friend was a little bit of a jerk, but he since we've, you know, helped our friendship, he's apologized. Now he's married to her and she's awesome. But when he got a girlfriend, of course I was going to see him less, right? Because before her, I got all of his free time and he only has so much free time. And now that she's here, we had to split that. And it wasn't just with me. He was now splitting his free time with everybody. His family saw him less. His friends saw him less. His hobbies he had less time for. And this happened because relationships just take time and they take energy. And that's a good thing, but that's what Paul is saying here in this passage. We see specifically in verses 32 through 35 that Paul is talking about the unmarried man. And the unmarried man is anxious about the Lord and how he can please the Lord. But he straight up says that the married man, his interests are divided because he cares about the Lord, but he also has to care about his wife. The single person just straight up has less things and less responsibilities that they have to worry for. They have the ability to be more focused on their relationship with the Lord. They have more time to serve. They can go on mission trips. They can, you know, serve at church. They can serve at different ministries. They can drop pretty much everything almost at any time if they have to go somewhere and go do something. If a position on a mission trip popped up last minute, a single person just has to call their boss and... You know, 20 minutes later, they're on a plane on the way across the ocean. But a married person has to call their spouse and be, oh, you know, do I have enough vacation time left? Uh, who's going to watch the kids? And, and they're going to be hurt. I missed their dance recital. And by the time they get off the phone, the plane's already left with a single person on it. Paul is painting this picture that if you remain single, you have a unique ability to be undivided in your devotion to the Lord. Now, you guys are pretty smart. And so I'm sure you're saying, okay, I get it. I understand. Paul is saying that I should be single, so I have more time for God. But for me personally, like, that's too big of a sacrifice for me. Like, there's some really cool girls in my class. There's some really good, cool guys that I know. And, you know, I want to be dating people. I want to get married and have a family. And, uh, you know, if I'm single my whole life, I'll just be sad and lonely. And I'll never be satisfied. Like, that's not for me. And honestly, that's a normal thought. That's a super normal thought. But as Christians, guys, we're called to make big sacrifices. The Bible is so clear that the Christian life is actually going to be full of sacrifices. We read in Luke chapter 14 that Jesus is teaching, he says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that you have can't be my disciple. This is insane. Guys, Jesus is saying that we have to pick up our cross, that we have to die to ourselves, give up everything that we have and everything that we want just so that we can follow him and be devoted to him. How can Jesus ask this of us? How can he be expecting us to be willing to do that? because he knows that this is actually what's best for us. He knows that giving up everything to serve him is what is actually best for us. Ultimately, 
will be happiest, most satisfied, most fulfilled when we completely surrender everything that we have over to Jesus and devote our life to him. When we say to him, there's nothing that I have that I value more than you. There is nothing in this world that I wouldn't give up just so I can have you. Jesus teaches this in a different way in a parable in Matthew. He tells a story about a man who finds some buried treasure in a field and he goes out and sells everything that he owns just so he can buy this field. And the reason he did this because the buried treasure was so incredibly valuable that he wanted to get rid of everything that he owned just so he could have this one thing. And this is the same truth we're learning about in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, that our relationship with the Lord is worth giving up everything, even dating and marriage. Now, this is a good point where I want to clarify that Paul is totally saying singleness is good. Singleness is great. He even goes as far to say that he wishes that we could all be single, that we could all be more devoted to the Lord. But Paul is not saying that everyone will be single or that everyone has to be single. And he doesn't say if you're single, you're a huge, big, fat sinner. As an example, I don't know if you've noticed, Jarrell is married. Jenny is married. Josh Brink got married this weekend. Yeah, go Josh. Come on, Josh and McKenna, congratulations. And I'm engaged, I'm getting married in a couple months. Yeah, clap for that too, come on, I'm pumped. Guys, marriage is amazing. Marriage is a gift that God created for us. It is good. And dating is a good thing too, because that's how you get to marriage. Dating is good and marriage is good. And honestly, most of you guys in this room will date somebody and or get married to somebody in the future. And that's a good thing. But Paul is saying that as though marriage is good and marriage is not a sin, singleness is also good. Singleness is also unique because it gives you the amazing benefit of an undevoted, uh, undivided devotion to God. But ultimately, our status here on earth, it isn't what is important and it will never ultimately fulfill us. Our financial status, our social status, our relationship status, these can all be good things but they will never mean anything if we are not devoting our lives to the Lord. Now, most of you, I'm taking a wild guess, have been on this earth for 13 to 18 years, okay? And that might feel like a long time, right? Because that's your whole life. That makes sense. But when you hold that up next to eternity, even if you take your 70 to 90, maybe 100 years on this earth next to eternity, it's not a long time. It's actually that fast. And that's what Paul is saying in some of the confusing verses in this passage, specifically 29 through 31, um, that no matter what state we're in, we need to be devoted to the Lord and have this eternal perspective. Because on earth, a life of riches, that won't last. That won't satisfy you. There's always more money. A life of experiences, that's not gonna last. That won't satisfy you. A life of achievements, of possessions, it won't last. Even the best and most healthy relationship can't fully satisfy you. Money, popularity, possessions, relationships, physical and sexual intimacy, and fun and experiences, all of these things will pass away and fade. We must, we must stop looking to these things for our satisfaction. These things won't fulfill you in the way that you think they will. The most perfect relationship here on earth, the one that you look to, that you strive for, that you want so desperately, will always be between two broken sinners that can't completely fulfill one another. We have to look for that type of satisfaction and that type of fulfillment in the only place that it can truly be found, in Christ. 
And once we do that, guys, our life is going to be so much better. Like, life will be genuinely more fun. And I'm not saying fake fun, like real fun. It'll be more satisfying. It'll be more meaningful. It won't be easy, but it'll be so incredibly much better. And you'll be more equipped to do everything. You'll be a better friend. You'll be a better sibling. You'll be a better son or daughter or teammate. And maybe even a better future spouse. Think about the type of person that you'd want to date or you'd want to marry. Do you want to date or marry someone that's always in a relationship? Running from one relationship to another, trying to find their happiness and fulfillment in that? Or do you want to date someone that has spent their entire life devoting themselves to the Lord, serving him and finding their satisfaction in him? A couple years ago, I heard a sermon preached on marriage by the one and only Jonathan Martin. Um, And he was talking about Hebrews 12. And he says these verses that say this, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. And in this sermon, he tells a story about a dad and a son. And the son was about to do his first race ever and the dad comes up to him and kneels down and says, hey, all you have to do Just look down at me. I'll be standing at the finish line. Just look at me. Focus on me and run as fast as you can into my arms. And the son trusted the father and that's exactly what he did. He ran as fast as he could and didn't look to the left. He didn't look to the right. He ran straight through the finish line into his father's arms. That's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to fix our eyes on Jesus running the course that's straight and narrow towards him, devoting our lives to him. So often we're running our course and we're, we're running and we're running and we're saying, God, I want to be devoted to you. I'm focused on you. I'm looking to you for my satisfaction, but, oh, I'm not married. You know what? I'm going to run over here. See if this girl can give me some fulfillment. Oh, that, that didn't work. I'm going to run over here. See if maybe this one will. Meanwhile, Jesus is at the finish line saying, come on, man, I'm waiting for you. What are you doing? I want you. What we should be doing is exactly what the kid did. Focusing our eyes on Jesus and running as fast as we can straight into his arms. Never looking to the left or to the right or veering off the path. Because ultimately, guys, the person that you actually want to be with isn't going to be one of those. The person that you want to be with is the person that runs up alongside of you. Where you don't have to go off the path. You don't even have to stop fixing your eyes on Jesus because they're running on the same path as you. Their eyes are focused on the same goal as you. That's the type of person that you want to be with. That's the type of person that you should be. So whether you're married or you're dating or you're single, keep your eyes on Jesus. Be devoted to the Lord and seek your satisfaction from him. And trust me, I'm 100% honest. If you do this, whether you're single or whether you're married, you will not be disappointed. It won't be easy, but you'll be fulfilled in the Lord. I want to leave you guys with one amazing example someone who does this super well. Um, I'm sure most of you know this person, you might not, but I can't think of any person that is a better example of what Paul is talking about than Josh Bressel. Let's give it up for Josh. He's not happy I'm doing this, but Josh is living out what Paul is talking about. Okay, enough clapping. He uses the time that he has to serve. Some of you might've even had him. He's a teacher here. He teaches all day. And then he stays here after school and helps us with youth group. He volunteers not just on Wednesday. He's here on Tuesday with the crazy crazy middle schoolers. He runs our games. He plans all of our games. He runs our middle school class. He even takes a lot of his students out to to food at different times and makes it a priority to spend time with them out of youth group. Almost every person in this room, whether you know it or not, has been affected by Josh Bressel and his service and devotion to the Lord. He's chosen to use this season in his life 
to be undivided in his devotion to the Lord. And countless lives have been changed because of that. People's in this room's life has been changed, changed because Josh Russell has been devoted to the Lord. And truthfully, ask any person on our staff, this youth group would not be run anywhere close to the way that it is without Josh Russell. Yeah, so let's thank Josh Russell one more time. Thank him for the work that he's put in. Thank him for the work that he's put in and the example that he's set. The example that Josh Russell has set of someone that is running towards the Lord and is living their life fully devoted to Jesus. The band can come up as we go to some next step takeaways. Number one, spending uh, with God. That's the first one. Spend time reading your Bible. I recommend reading Philippians. That's a great book. One of my favorites. And when you're reading, think about what God has done for you. And if you're living a life devoted to him or not. Think about that. Identify the things in your life that are taking priority over God. And spend time in prayer, offering those things up to him with others. Encourage one another. If you're single or someone else that you know is single, encourage them to use the time that they have to serve the Lord and to serve others. And encourage them because singleness isn't easy, but it is good. Also, don't play into the lie of this world that you can't be fulfilled and happy as a single person. Don't pressure your friends to get into relationships. Don't make them feel bad if they're single. And if your friends are pressuring other people in the relationships, call them out. And if you're dating someone, I challenge you, spend time with someone that you trust praying if this is actually the right thing for you. Or if you're seeking fulfillment in something outside of the Lord and you don't have any reason to be with that person. And lastly, on mission. Think through ways in which you can use the time that you have to be devoted to the Lord and serve him and serve others. Guys, be a light in your school. Be a light in your community. Have a high value on singleness and prioritize your life so that you are fully devoted to him. Fully devoted to our God. Right, let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much. We do not deserve the love that you have for us. What you did on the cross, dying for our sins, God, I pray that, that we would think about that, that we would desire to understand what you have done and understand who you are. That as we go to small groups, we would be focused, that we would actually talk through these things that are meaningful and powerful that we would evaluate, are we living our life for you? Or are we seeking fulfillment from the things of this earth? God, we know and we trust that you are here for your children, that you protect us, whether singled or married or dating, you are the one that will fulfill us and satisfy us. We pray that we would believe that, and that we would know and love you. Pray this in your son's name, amen. Before creation, eternity in your hand, you spoke the earth into motion, my soul now to stand. You stood before my fail. the cross for my shame my sin weighed upon your shoulders my soul mounts to stay so what can I say what can I do Start, oh God, 
stand before you tonight, our hearts abandoned and in awe of you. May we be fully devoted to you and wherever we're at in our lives. May we rest everything aside. May we just focus on you. We thank you for who you are. Through Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, y'all have good groups. Amen.